this talk is on 3D printing, how to effectively utilize the MarkForge printers. My name is Caleb Loilak. I am a senior at Mountain View. I am 971's senior class of 2020. And I am assembly lead for this next season. And I joined just a little over a year ago, the summer before junior year. So that might be a little bit of an example of how you can still join late in your high school career and still have a great time in FRC. And another thing I did last year was a lot of 3D printing. So I was the one running around starting builds at weird times of the day and managing the, the USB drive that plugged into the back of all the printers. Brief introduction. I really hope that you know what 3D printing is if you've signed up for this talk, but 3D printing is a system of additive manufacturing where printers extrude um, melted material. Usually it's a plastic called PLA. Um, in layers and then they build up those layers to create the part that you've specified of any shape with your CAD file. So this traditional 3D printing here, traditional means the common plastic PLA with a, a lower end printer, um, can be pretty good for your team. It has the upside of being um, a pretty easy entry level computer controlled manufacturing system. Um, and it gives you a lot less restrictions on part shape when you're making parts. Um, and it can get really complicated, but you can still make those in-house if you have a 3D printer in the lab. Some of the downsides of this PLA, though, is that any 3D printer is still going to take hours to print tiny little parts. And the plastic material is going to be brittle depending on where the forces are applied to the part. Um, and it can be messy or inconsistent. And of course, the size of your part, no matter what printer you have, is always limited to your printer bed. But the printer that we're talking about today, the Mark Forged, um, solves a lot of those downsides, particularly the PLA material problem um, and some of the, some of the speed, uh, strength, quality problems. Um, we are very fortunate on the 71 to have access to a Mark Forged printer permanently in the lab, as well as two others on campus that we can use um, these are very expensive, but they're very, very nice, um, and we're really grateful that we have them. So the MarkForge material that we use is called onyx, and when I pass some of these parts around, you can see it's this black material. It's a combination of nylon and chopped up carbon fiber um, instead of the regular plastic, and it is really, really strong. Um, it's really consistent in the way that it can print out layers um, to your shape, so it's dimensionally accurate and then it produces a really great surface finish that um, is a lot less recognizable as a 3D printed part than most of the ones that you've seen. So those layers, the differences between each of the individual layers is less noticeable, and overall it just makes really, really cool looking parts. And then Kevlar is another function that we have available on our um, MarkForge printers, which is just a re reinforcement material that it can print from a separate model, um, from a separate nozzle, that adds Kevlar in between the layers for even stronger parts. One of the, the systems that comes with the Marked Forge is called Iger. Um, usually there's some sort of online processing system for whatever printer you have um, for Marked Forged. It's this online website um, that has a lot of different features of what you can do adjusting part properties, um, adjusting like what's going to be on the printer at any given time. Um, I won't go over all the little nitpicky functions that Iger has. If you really want to look at these, the slides are available on frc971.org. But um, the two main important top, um, words that you need to know are the difference between parts and the difference between built. So parts are the CAD files. They're, you know, the parts, the individual pieces that you need to print. And builds are once you have imported all those parts into your online system, you organize them into different groups that the printer will print all at once. So it doesn't print one piece at a time. It can move from layer to layer and change when it's extruding material to do multiple at once. And in Iger or in your online software, you can change the print properties. And the main print properties are fill and reinforcements. Fill is what determines how strong your part is. It's, it's what determines how much material you use. Um, generally, we use default settings on our marked forged which is triangular shape fill at about 30, 40% density. And those usually come on a default with whatever software you have. Um, but then we adjust them depending on how much force a part needs to withstand or exert. Because if a really flimsy part withstands a lot of force, um, it's going to break down and you're going to have to either print multiple parts or your robot's going to fall apart. Um, and then reinforcements 
is another thing you can set. As you can see in that photo in the, in the bottom left, um, they are the layers of Kevlar or whatever fiber material you have that adds extra strength. So on 9711, we don't usually print a lot with Kevlar um, or any other reinforcement. But when it comes down to it, there are some parts that just really, really need that extra strength. So we use Kevlar on our 2018 robot for the printed claw body. That's this piece. Um, I can pass it around. So this printed claw body needed to withstand a lot. It was constantly being slammed into by all the cubes that the robot was picking up. Um, it would withstand the forces of the claws compressing and releasing. Sure, just press, pass it around any way you want. You can just go around the room. Um, and we added layers of Kevlar there because it's a pretty big part, needed to withstand a lot of force. And of course, we didn't want to have to reprint it if it wore down or broke. Um, so that was just like our extra level of security. And that's one of the best examples we have of part that really needs Kevlar reinforcements. Next, this is, um, we'll just go through some separate parts that have different levels of fill. Um, there's lots of trial and error when it comes to choosing what fill you need. So more experience, you'll be able to understand and intuit more what, um, what type of fill you should set. But this is a part that would take a default or a lighter fill. These are fingers that we used to prototype last season, a possible disc intake. We didn't end up using it, of course. We went with the suction cup. But um, these fingers would just go in through the center hole in the disc, expand outwards, apply light pressure, and then hold it up. So these we printed with a lighter fill because it was prototyping. So what we prioritized was speed of print, and we didn't need it to be really strong or last a long time. So we just used the default settings there. And they worked really well for prototyping, just a proof of concept. And then this is a part that needed a heavier fill. These are our camera mounts, um, camera mount cases that we used on the 2019 robot. If you look at the robot over there, I don't know if it's immediately obvious, there are six cameras all over the robot that stayed on through the whole season. And they each have a case around them that just has all the necessary electronics, wires, a little bit, bit of padding. And since these were going to stay on the robot for the whole season, we needed to make sure that they were printed with a heavier fill. And in addition, when I pass around the part, this lip here is very thin. So we needed to make sure that it was printed with a heavier fill so that it would be less likely to break off. Because really tiny pieces, of course, are more brittle. So you need to reinforce them. You can pass those in different directions, too, because it's the same piece. So there's that. Um, and then this part, another heavy fill part, of course, the suction cup. Um, this, uh, this lip that we needed had to be heavy fill, because, of course, it's one of the most important parts on the robot. It's what's moving around. It's what's touching all the game pieces. And it is, um, it actually, not on this piece, but um, on the actual suction cup on the robot, has uh, an epoxy inside. So we wanted to make sure that it was really, really smooth seal inside. So we had to heat gun it and then apply an epoxy to the inside. So it needed to be a heavier fill so that there wouldn't be any holes that appeared from the inside part when we heat gunned it and then applied the epoxy. Um, so it was necessary for those two different reasons, which is just another interesting application of what you can do with the parts, right? You don't just you don't always just take them off the printer and use them solid. Um, we had to adjust some of the surface finish, um, and we had to play around with stuff like epoxies. So this is, that's our actual suction cup. Pretty cool. And then this is a part that takes solid fill. Um, when it comes to smaller parts, we default a little bit towards heavier fills, just because we can with a smaller part. It doesn't take that much extra time. And because oftentimes, some of the smaller parts are the parts that are the most important to withstand that force. So this timing belt clamp was used for our stilts. And it hooked into the timing belt, and it had to hold it really steady as the stilts pulled up the entire weight of the robot. So this was really, really important to be strong. It was definitely withstanding a lot of forces. Um, and so this is completely solid onyx material. Is your time? to print on the Mark IVs the same as basically uh, any other 3D printer? I, time to print does vary from printer to printer just based on the way that the machine works. Um, I can't speak a lot to the properties of a bunch of different printers because, of course, I am the most experienced with the Mark IVs, but I can definitely, um, well, you're I can definitely discuss that later. Well, you're calling how long did it take to print that? 
Um, the who's about oh, of this stars. takes um, you can oh, see the print know. time in the properties menu there. This oh, little piece good, took an hour and twenty minutes. Yeah, so it does take a really long time. So you want to do everything you can to make everything more efficient to maximize. Um, that eleven hours. That sifting cup was eleven and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Camera mounts were three and a half hours. Yeah, and then of course we'll discuss later how you can organize your parts and have little tips and tricks to be able to get those faster. Okay, so then the next part is about workflow when working with your 3D printer. Oftentimes, um, 3D printing is a little bit relegated to the side. It's not given the same respect as other, um, other manufacturing processes, but it's really important to realize that 3D printing is just another way to get your parts made. So if you give it the same level of attention and the same level of efficiency as you would, say, parts on a router, parts on a lathe, then you can make everything just a lot more efficient during your season. So our first steps, um, just the, the basic workflow for uh, taking a part from CAD to printing to assembly is to prepare the part. So you export your STL into Iger, um, and then you make sure that if the part the person designing the part and the person printing the part are different. You have to be clear that you're on the same page about what forces it's going to exert. Um, if you want strength or speed, for example, in the prototyping, we prioritize speed. But in most cases, you would prioritize strength. Um, and then determine if you need to use fiber and what layers of fiber those are where they're going to be placed um, and how much fiber you're going to use. And then the last step, just a, a little hindsight safety measure is to get checked by a person that can run those Iger accounts. Um, so usually mentors, also a couple of students, um, depending year to year. And then once you start to print, we use a Mark Forge, which does not have a heated bed, so we have to apply glue um, to the bed. And then it has a light fuse with the, the material that's printed so that every, all the layers stay down and they're solid in the same same shape that they were intended to be. And then when we're done, we take the prints off the bed, um, wipe off the glue, and actually, if you notice, the wherever the timing belt clamps that are floating around, um, those didn't get glue taken off. So if you, if you touch it, just the moisture in your fingers, you can probably feel that they're a little sticky. Um, that's why it's really important to take the glue off, but I did just grab some spares out of the back of the lab. Um, and then finally, we put them in a basket of parts, and they're inspected, and then they're kitted into whatever um, assembly that they need to be. So once again, another emphasis on giving 3D printing respect and organization as a manufacturing process. Um, we make drawings for 3D printed parts, just like we would any other type of part. And we inspect them to make sure that nothing went wrong, that they still have all the dimensions that they need. And then we get them. OK, any questions? that section. Finally, optimization. This is, this is the best advice I have to give. So the way that you work with your printer can really change the efficiency of what you're putting out, can change the number of parts that you produce during the season. And so there are a couple tips and tricks that you can use. Um, and those three, trip, the <laughs> those three tricks are designing your parts really intentionally with 3D printing in mind, um, to set the orientation really intentionally, and then to schedule your prints. So we'll go over each one of these three. First of all, when you're designing your parts, of course you have to be, make a conscious decision about whether or not you're printing. Um, so if the part would be much simpler to machine with a subtractive manufacturing process, of course you don't want to take the time or the material to print it. And if the part would ideally be made in metal, you would prefer not to use a 3D printing process. So if you can mill it or um, get it done easily off-site in your lab, it would be much more efficient to use an external system. Um, that's not the printer. And then finally, uh, finally, one of the pretty basic question that you have to ask yourself is, will it fit on the printer bed? Will it take too long to print? Um, that was definitely the largest part that we had to print during the 2018 season. Um, during the 2019 season, we had a big print, um, a big part that 
that'll be on one of these next slides, that took 23 hours. It was about this big. Um, it's one of those clamps that goes on the arm um, for the, the suction cup arm. And it was, it was pretty big. That was about the limit of what we could do. So you have to be really aware of when is the best time to use a printer. So these are the three most basic concepts of designing in CAD, SOLIDWORKS, whatever your um, software is, um, for 3D printing. So printing supports um, is when the printer creates a, a basic scaffolding underneath the layers. If there's layers that are going to be printed over thin air with nothing beneath them, um, they would just fall down because gravity works. So <laughs> you want to not add any lips, any unnecessary edges or overhang um, that would create excess scaffolding because that will take more material to print. It uses the, the same Onyx support material to print that. Um, and then it'll take more time as well. Um, then, of course, don't put material where it needs to be. Additive manufacturing means you start with what you really need and then you add as according. You don't, um, you have to make sure that you're not uh, designing your parts to minimize the material taken away. You're minimizing the material used. And then finally, um, when there's a right angle that would normally be used on your part for better strength and print quality, since it'll exert a lot of force on that one right angle, you want to add a fillet, which is just a curve, or a chamfer, which is an angled cut on the side to minimize that 90 degree angle, because that'll better endure the force, that'll have better strength, and it'll also improve the print quality, since with 90 degree angles, the printer moves um, it can't move perfectly. So there's going to be a little extra material extruded in that edge, and you won't get the sharp, beautiful corner that you've envisioned. It'll be a little blobby. Um, so if you just add a little fillet, it'll do just as intended. These are, these are what supports look like. If you notice on the, the claw, um, the claw body, um, there's supports inside the, inside the main tube and then underneath. Um, that's just because the printer can't print into thin air. So it needs to build something up, and that uses the same material. That can be easily removed, though, because the, the adhesion between the layers there is really simple. It's just like attached at a couple points. So you pull those out after you're done printing. Um, but it's very important to be intentional with how you're orienting the part in your Iger software in order to minimize those supports printed. So pretty obvious example here. If you have this tube clamp, and you don't want to create extra supports, you would not face it down with that gap down because it would create prints underneath. So you can see the difference in the orientation here is almost half an hour just, um, just from flipping it upside down. And another thing you can keep in mind with orientation, um, with a printer like Mark Forged, which again is very, very nice and very expensive, we're very fortunate to have it, it's not as much of a consideration um, for which sides are going to be the nicest finish. But if you really want to ensure that a certain side is very detailed, is very precise, you want to orient that on the top or bottom of the, of the part printed. Because the side layers, of course, um, are affected by the thickness of each individual layer, um, rather than where the printer can move. And then finally, this is my favorite part. Um, this is just the trick for having prints be ready sooner having them come out faster, is to manage the printers so that they run when you're not in the lab, when you're not doing work, and then have those parts ready um, when you get into meeting times. And the way that this worked, the way that we did it last season, was to start by prioritizing your parts, work with the people that are doing CAD, make sure that you understand which ones need to be done, which one just broke that you need to print another one, um, which parts are the most important to get ready, and then you will print those first. Um, and then know which parts um, take longer, which parts take shorter time. And then you organize all that information into a spreadsheet, which I'll show in a couple slides, just the time to print, the priority, um, and then you can use those numbers to arrange Iger builds, which will have specific durations that you can use to ensure that the parts are going from convenient time to convenient time. And then finally, if you have access to one or more printers, um, like we do, then you leave one open for what we call panic prints. And this means that instead of having printers constantly running, constantly running during meeting times, you have one open just in case something breaks, just in case like you lose something, just in case you need to um, 
do something unexpected. And an example of what we needed a panic print for um, last season was we had these, these tiny Omni wheels and we needed them hex. Um, they're used on the intake for the, the robot roller. And we didn't have enough hex wheels. So what we did last minute um, is we printed these converters. We got the CAD file online and we printed these. These took like half an hour each and we were able to get them same day instead of ordering them online and waiting for a week for them to come in. And so that was like a, a pretty great panic print. Um, that's where you, I was very thankful for them. You can see. So passing around, those tiny pieces are the converters. And then there's one wheel that's round on the inside, or one wheel that's a normal hex, and then the other wheel that has the converters inside them. Yeah, you can see like the print finish. Okay. This is how you schedule parts into Iger builds. Um, this is just what a build looks like when you're in the online software. You can obviously put a lot of different print, a lot of different parts onto the build. Um, and this one works out. It's a day and 11 hours spent printing to finish this. And it goes from 11 p.m. on a Friday meeting to 10 a.m. on a Sunday meeting. So you would start that at the very end. We have meetings Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday during the build seasons. You would start that at the end of a Friday meeting, and then it would be ready for you at the beginning of a Sunday meeting so you could get those parts inspected, kitted, and straight into assembly. This one is a day and five hours, just a bunch of camera mount cases. Um, those would start at the beginning of a Saturday meeting and end around the middle of a Sunday meeting. And once again, just very, very convenient times for you to work. And they go all night, so you're taking advantage of that time. And then this is, this is the big part that I was referring to, that really big one in the middle takes 23 hours to print. So in total, that takes two days and 21 hours to print all those parts together. And so if you start that at the beginning of a Wednesday meeting, it'll end at a lovely convenient time on a Saturday meeting for you. Um, and our printers were, were put a lot to good use during the normal season. So we always had two constantly running, um, and then we had one open for panic prints. This is how we did it. This is a document. It's a Google Sheet. Um, just a pretty simple spreadsheet, but it was super, super helpful. We have information about each part that needs to be printed, um, about how many that we need. We built three robots last season, um, one real one, one for drive practice, and then one for code to test. And so it told us exactly how many for all of the robots. And then based on how many had already been printed or were currently on a printer, it tells us how many we still need to fill in. So the zeros are parts that have been finished, parts that we can feel comfortable about. That one there is a part that hasn't yet been pr printed, so it's a, it's a red light um, just to notify us that we still need to get th those into a build. And then the negative number is a part that had a print extra, so it has a spare available. And then, oh, that part at the very end with a line through it is a part that was deleted that we decided we no longer wanted to use on the robot. But it's still important to keep that in your document um, because if someone finds a part around the lab, oh, hey, I know this is part 175. Why isn't it in a kit? What's happening with it? We know that we did print some, but that we're no longer using it. And it's just another step in your like, constant um, organized inventory. OK, general sum summary for the whole talk. If you remember anything, remember this. Um, as long as you put glue on the bed, it's pretty hard to mess up and forge prints. So this is like a basic system of how to work together with your printer, um, how to organize it and be as efficient as possible. Um, this is the worst print we've ever made on a Mark Forge printer. I'll pass it around. This is what happens when you forget to put glue on the bed and it runs for 24 hours until someone finds it and shuts it down. Um, this was supposed to be some, uh, I think some washers, as it started a washer here and then just some, some basic other parts. It's completely unrecognizable now, but it makes for a great keychain for the printer USB. Um, and other than that, we worked with a Mark Forge. Wall of shame. Yeah, it definitely is a wall of shame part. Um, I'm not going to name names, but it was not me that forgot to put glue on the bed. <laughs> and so from there, you just want to work on streamlining your process, making sure that you're giving it the same level of respect and organization as any other manufacturing. So that's why you establish and stick to your organizational system. Ours is just those, 
those basic eight steps of going from CAD to print to assembly. Um, and then you want to design your parts with 3D printing in mind. Once again, those supports, those fillets. Um, and then decide when your parts should be stronger. It's really important to print that heavier fill. Don't prioritize conserving your material when you really, really need to have your robot um, have all the parts sufficient, um, endure through the whole season. And then orient your parts to minimize your support printing. And if you want to, to make sure that parts are really detailed on certain edges. And then finally, you want to prioritize all your parts and then schedule them um, to end at your convenient time so you have them whenever you need them. Okay, what questions do you have? Do you mind going back to the previous yeah. slide? That we can just Thank you. And question over here? Yeah, I had uh, two actually, if that's okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> really basic, what glue are you using? Um, we just use an Elmer's glue stick and it's just the material in the glue. It doesn't have to be wet or anything like that. The material in the glue just bonds with the nylon in the material. So it, it creates that like temporary stick that allows it to, to work. And I noticed on the claw, I think that's what you were calling it, right? The, the claw body? Yeah, it's the, the really chunky one. Yeah, those are heat, uh, uh, heat set inserts on the top, yeah. right? Do you, yeah. Have you had any, like, do you feel like those worked out really well? Or like, um, I actually was not here during the 2018 season because I joined during junior year, but if you'd like, I can definitely connect you with someone that would talk all day about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can yeah. talk to me after. The, are you bothered by moisture content in the uh, material? Yes, yeah, so Onyx is moisture sensitive, which means that we need to always keep it in a dry box and that um, if rolls have been exposed to the air, that they need so to be dehydrated. As you extrude? Yeah, so the, it's inside a dry box that has a tube that goes into the back of the printer. Um, if it's exposed to moisture, this is just a property of Onyx, PLA doesn't have the same moisture sensitivity. Um, if it's exposed to moisture, then it gets air bubbles trapped inside it, and then you have inconsistent prints because it goes, it's thinking it's extruding material, but instead it's a bubble. So then you get parts that are really gloppy, really messy. Um, that's one of, the only, one of the only other ways you can mess up prints. And yeah. cost per kilogram? And what's the value? Um, if you, would you mind going back to one of the slides with the parts on them? They do have estimated cost in the information. So material cost twelve ninety six for that cup. How many? Lip. How much did it weigh? Um, what's the plastic volume? So fifty five cubic centimeters is about thirteen dollars. Yeah, it's for the Mark Forge roll of onyx. Somewhere in the realm of $160 for one spool. And what diameter are you extruding? Um, three, I'm not sure. I can definitely check that. Oh, again. Sorry. How do you keep the catalog of your pieces? Like, how do you know that that piece was a 175? Oh, um, we have the SolidWorks CAD um, that you can reference back to it. And also, when you import parts into IRA, would you mind going to the IGR slide? It's like really far back there. Yeah. When you import parts into Iger, you give each one a name. And so the 971 manufacturing system, um, I don't know if any of you are going to the talk next. It's Senya's talk on manufacturing and how we organize parts. Um, assigns each individual part a number. And then that's how we track um, exactly what design is going to which part. Um, so we can, we can do it in Iger, we can reference back in SolidWorks, and then there's also part numbers on all the spreadsheets we have. So Iger is similar to Cura? Uh, Cura for which? Cura for most 3D printers. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Time is it. All right. So we have a little extra time. When are we, when are we up? Uh, well, the next thing in here is not for another half hour. Okay. Great. Um, with a little extra time, I can, we have a couple of options. You can ask me questions about absolutely anything. Um, and I can also go through, if any of you guys are curious, um, talk about some of the parts in the builds. Um, really anything, I can answer questions about Mark Forged, about joining later on in your high school career, about uh, work-life balance. <laughs> yes? How long has 971 been using 3D printers? Um, we, hmm, at least three seasons. Yeah, I, I inherited the 3D printer role um, last season, and it had been established for a couple of years, yeah. We, we had the printer donated to us um, by Mark Forged, 
And then we also have those two other printers that are on campus in the engineering room. Yeah. Uh, how many 3D printers do you guys have? And do you guys have to use smart forges? Or okay, so the question was how many 3D printers do we have? Uh, we have access to one permanent one in the lab, which is what we always use, and then we have access to two others. So our engineering class on campus also has two Mark Forge printers. So we've worked out an agreement with the lovely Miss Conaway, the teacher for that class. Um, so she lets us use the printers during the other season, and we provide the materials. And then what was your other question? Uh, do you guys only have like Mark Forge, or do you guys use any? Do we only have Mark Forge? Yeah, that's that's what we use. Um, it's the highest quality we could probably get right now. Um, and they are very expensive, but very worth it. Yes. Did you uh, investigate, or what was, how did you arrive at using Kevlar versus Caprice? Talk about um, why. Yeah, so how do we arrive at using Kevlar for reinforcement materials? Um, the Mark Forge only has a couple of reinforcement materials available. Um, some of it is like carbon fiber reinforcements as well as Kevlar. Since Onyx already has carbon fiber in it, we usually um, don't have to use a lot of reinforcements because the material itself is very, very strong. So I, when the decision was made before I had joined, um, I think Kevlar was just the obvious choice to add an additional material that would create that more strength. Yeah. This, was this like? Okay, yeah. This is probably the most important step in this process is to get checked by an agri account holder. Um, I, based on what I've heard about the way that other teams can manufacture sometimes, and we're very susceptible to this too, sometimes there's a, a little jump between things where people um, don't get their work looked at by an outside person and then there might be some mistakes that don't get caught. So this is just how you make sure that the print fill, the supports, orientation, everything is set right. They asked you to print stuff out before they actually went and machined it. I was this a cheaper option for you to, to 3D print something, do a couple of prototypes, and then go to a final build using mm. machine? I definitely in prototyping, 3D printing is is very very helpful. Um, so those fingers. I, I can't say for sure if we would have 3D printed those had we decided to use those on the actual robot, um, but. It's very, very helpful. We have, Iger allows you to group together different parts based on what they're used for. So we have several groups of just, just prototyping parts, and there's part after part, because it's a really easy way to relatively quickly get what you need done. Yes? So like, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but like, the desktop mark two is the cheapest model that Mark 40 offers is the reinforcement like option something specific to the desktop mark two and above, or can use it on the Onyx one. Okay, yeah. Um, so the Mark II is actually the um, the higher end model as compared to the Onyx one. We use the Mark II in the lab, and then the two others that we have available are Onyx one Onyx ones, um, and I. I would advise you to look at the Mark Forge website on whether or not they have Kevlar reinforcement options. Um, it's, they are very expensive, but they're really, really nice. Um, and we, we have used the Kevlar function um, a couple of times, but if your team's resources only allow you to get one that doesn't print that number of supports, if it still has a really, really durable material, then you can definitely continue to print parts for your robot. Why are Mark Forged preferable to other 3D printers? Okay, Mark Forged, um, along with along with the quality and the price tag, just have a really really nice system um, for working with your printers. I could probably wax about the benefits of Mark Forged all day. Um, they just have put a lot of thought into the diff different ways that you interact with the printer, um, into the types of materials that they have. So this nylon and carbon fiber material is only available through Mark Forged. Um, the printer we have can also print solid carbon fiber if you really wanted to shell out the money for that, which <laughs> that would be a lot. Um, and the Iger software is really, really nice. It's got a lot of different functions on it. And these printers are also um, wireless compatible. So if you connect them to the internet, um, we can start a build remotely. So I've done that before where if you just have the bed constantly glued up, 
um, and we know that it's empty, I can start a print from another room or from my house, um, and it'll still get done. Oh, right underneath, yeah. So he's asking about the, the little screen that's um, a little overexposed in this photo here. Um, that's the, the screen on the printer that shows print finished. And then there's an option for you to rate the quality of the print, which is just another, just another function that you can use to track back to all the prints that you've made, um, the quality, potentially what happened. Um, sometimes when we've had prints with bad quality, it's just been because the material is wet. But it's always good to just have more data, more information that you can use to track back. So is your Iger in the cloud? You, is, you send it out? Yes, our, our Iger is in the cloud. So it's an online. You can sign into it from any web browser. Um, and then you get an account. So it's all secure, password protected. No one else can start prints from our printer remotely. Um, uh, so that's why we have Iger account users. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rashawn Shaw, a student on Team 971. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more videos and resources, please subscribe and visit our website at frc971.org.